Mark has adopted a pet. <laughs> Did you name it? Oh, no. <laughs> We're gonna name it. This is this is like our first pet together. <laughs> yes, I like it. <laughs> so Drew, are you happy with your new pet? <laughs> <laughs> You're so happy. This is what happens when Caroline gets caught in a conversation <laughs> and Mark is left with devices. some devices. <laughs> I think it's a good purchase. I actually, I support this. I really like them too and I want to support them. On the bum? I mean, I'm not sure about the drooling, but you know. I like the ones with the fur. They're I know, cute. I want one of those too, but I just want that kind of money. Two pieces of the same. by the way is they put a little blip over the ear and the what I find very interesting about that is that whoever put that together actually knew a little something about the visual system because it's not exactly right at the ear but it's down in the brain stem uh, right in that same general vicinity is where we have some of the uh, additional neural processing for vision that helps us keep track helps us track things that are moving uh, so uh, and, and, the, uh, and the part back in the back of the brain is in the right place for visual cortex. So it was, uh, it was very interesting. You can see the arm, how the arm has to go up into the shoulder. And it is not just where we normally think of with a prosthetic, which is uh, essentially is going to be from either a lower limb prosthetic or uh, it's going to connect here. There'll be a, a stump of the upper arm, but the uh, and, and I'll show you some, some really neat stuff with prosthetics in, in, in a little bit. Uh, the leg prosthetics, at the time, there was no consideration of being able to do anything at the hip. I mean, this predates hip, hip replacements, so um, if Caden had a little bit of our current day knowledge, he might have said, okay, artificial hip, but then the, the bionics from mid-thigh on down. Uh, so now let's take a look at can we rebuild? This is, this is an x-ray from a friend of mine uh, who's had multiple back surgeries. And the, the person gave me permission to show this. This is, this is state-of-the-art rebuild right now. State-of-the-art rebuild right now. She basically got a titanium cage and bracing uh, for, for the spine. And we could do better than that. Uh, Six Million Dollar Man inspired us to do better than that. So let's take a look at what we already have in the way of prosthetics, okay? So here's the difference between 1972 to 2019. At the, on the left, you see artificial legs of 40 years ago, 45 years ago. Pretty much a socket for the stump, a pivot at the knee, a pivot at the, or maybe not even a pivot at the ankle, and a foot. Very, very rigid, very heavy. These are much heavier than what a natural leg would be. And on the right, we see two individuals who each have a running blade for their artificial leg. There are, there is a, um, the blade is actually called a flex foot cheetah. In 2012, we had an Olympic athlete competing who was a double amputee who strapped on flex foot cheetah running blades and placed eighth in his races. He'd actually meddled in the Paralympics in 2008 and 2012. Now, rather checkered story because of the fact that um, he um, 
was accused of murdering his girlfriend, so we don't usually use him as our primary example anymore. But I was in a running group. Uh, I, I started walking, started walking uh, uh, five Ks and the like, and there was a young lady who was nine months out from being fitted with her prosthetic, and she had a running blade. And she would strap on the running blade and, uh, and go out with us during our training. She walked at first and then she ran. Uh, at somewhere around March this year, that was two years ago, around March this year, she ran her first marathon. And she placed very, very well. She finished in about six hours. Uh, so this is somebody I know, we, we would watch her. It's a little awkward because what she would do is she would do a sort of a sideways hop. But she would do that because, <coughs> the, because the artificial leg would give her so much springiness that she would make sure she hopped onto it, put weight on it, and it would propel her forward. Uh, this was actually an issue because prior to the 2008 Olympics or Paralympics, um, the International Olympic uh, Committee had outlawed the use of running blades in the Paralympics because there was uh, there was a thought that it provided too much of an advantage. And the, uh, the different uh, prosthetics that can be fitted and can be uh, used by a person with an artificial leg right now are absolutely fantastic. Anybody watch Dancing with the Stars? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so there was a young lady who competed who was also a uh, double amputee and she danced on her artificial legs. It's just absolutely fascinating. Now what's very important about this is these are not brain controlled limbs. These are springs and levers and a basically using physics to do the job. Um, there's, a, there's a reason why we don't actually have much in the way of brain neural controlled artificial legs is because at present right now we don't need them as desperately as we need upper limb prosthetics and other types of prosthetics. So now let's take a look at an arm prosthetic, an upper limb prosthetic. Uh, vintage 1972 is the hook and the hook was operated basically by attaching to a muscle in the back and when a person would flex their shoulder, it would open and close the hook. And that was it. That's the sum total of artificial arm in 1972. In 2019, we actually have an FDA, Medicare, and insurance approved replacement neurally controlled artificial arm. Yes? Um, in Norway, um, a guy, um Oh yeah, it's not that they're not capable, I'm but I'm just out that, uh, it's not that they're not capable, but in a, uh, in a survey that was conducted by the Department of Defense Agency, DARPA. Uh, DARPA is their science fiction branch. Uh, they, they do experimentation and they start projects to see if they can be done. If they can be done, they try to spin it off into something else. And the, there were a couple of things that were said, particularly by the amputees returning from war. I want to be able to hold a hairbrush and brush my hair. Can't do that with a hook. Uh, for one thing, they don't have the wrist flexion, they don't have the elbow flexion. The Luke arm that you see right here on the uh, on this subject is one that has full finger, wrist, and if elbow is needed, and elbow flexion. It's controlled by the nerves. It's not brain connected. It's actually connected to nerves in the upper arm. And the surgical process that they go through is to a surgeon will go in through and, and, and identify the different nerve bundles that would operate the wrist, operate the fingers, operate the elbow, 
and move them to a specific place on the surface or just under the surface of the arm, just under the skin. And then electrodes sitting on top of the skin will pick up the signals, the electrical signals from those nerves and use those to operate the various, uh, the various joints in the limb. The hook is heavy. Yet again, heavier than a natural human arm. The Luke arm weighs the same as the equivalent flesh and blood. This is our state of the art in 2019. This is bionics. Finally, we're starting to see something that looks like bionics. By the way, the guy whose company uh, invented and makes this arm is Dean Kamen. He's the guy that, that invented that two wheel Segway you stand up and run along that you see all the mall cops using. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what we've got. Now, interestingly enough from a, the point of view of a hearing prosthetic, we've actually had um, a bionic ear, if you will, since the 70s. Uh, cochlear implants were first uh, implanted in the late 70s, and they're, uh, not only are they well accepted, we're implanting infants and children with cochlear implants. And a cochlear implant is not quite the way it was imagined in Six Million Dollar Man because the electrode goes into the cochlea. The cochlea is a spiral shaped structure that is wider at the beginning and narrower at the end and it has, it's a tube that has a membrane running through it and the membrane is attached to little hair-like cells that run all down the lining. So when the fluid in that in the cochlea vibrates at a particular frequency, there will be a place on that triangular membrane running down this narrowing tube that will vibrate in sympathy with whatever the auditory frequency is. And this vibration then is picked up in a particular location by particular cells that are connected to a part of the brain that says, okay, this is a high C. This is an A. This is our basic fundamental 440 hertz tone that we use to synchronize all of our musical instruments. Or this is a, um, let's see, we would go uh, about a half hertz would be down here, um, uh, half kilohertz. And then a uh, maybe a 4,000 kilohertz would be <clears throat> no, voice won't do it this time of morning. So it was more like about two, two thousand hertz. So, uh, but a high, uh, high pitch screech. And then, of course, we all know sixty hertz, right? Yeah. So, uh, so each of those frequencies is picked up at different places along the membrane in the cochlea. So, what the implant does is stick in a long electrode that has points along its length, along the tube, that can deliver any electrical stimulus, and then we map those. We map, okay, location one, aha, location one is, is 250 hertz. Location two, that may be somewhere closer to about 750 hertz, and keep on going down, all the way down the electrode, and all the way down the frequency map. Then, there is a small receiver implanted under the skin, uh, usually somewhere in this location right here. And on the outside, a hearing aid with a speech processor. What that does is it cuts all of the other frequencies out and just emphasizes the ones that are speech, uh, translates that into what, uh, what point on the electrode should be stimulated and lets then uh, pass that information uh, through the skin to the receiver on the inside, send it to the stimulator, stimulate the place in the cochlea appropriate for that frequency. Now, cochlear implants are designed primarily for speech. They don't do a really good job with music. So a person who was born with hearing goes deaf and gets a cochlear implant will tell you that the implant is horrible for music. A person who was born deaf or with minimal hearing who gets a cochlear implant can in fact tell you that they enjoy music and it's all what they got used to and what their brain programmed for. However, the latest, mo uh, the latest models that are coming out now do in fact have 
non-speech modes in their processors. And you can have a ta tablet to tell the processor what you want the process for. Or on your phone, and you'll see some examples of that later. So 1972 to 2019. Uh, in 1972, if you lost an eye, you wore a glass eye. Or nothing, or an eye patch. Uh, in, 19, in 2019, we don't have a full bionic eye. Because what we don't have yet, although we're, there, there are groups working on it, is a connection back to the visual part of the brain. What we can do is with patients who have lost the photosensitive cells in their retina, in the part of the eye that actually picks up and turns a light, a spot of light into a neural signal, if the neurons are still there, even if the photosensors, photodetector cells are not, we can put an electrode array on the retina and stimulate it with patterns that can be picked up and look, give at least the rudimentary ability to see. Uh, and what would be very important is, would be for a person to be able to see the edges of the door or that there is a chair or that there is a person, or where are the edges of the coffee mug or the Coke bottle or something like that. And even be able to read maybe one letter at a time, but that's still reading. Uh, when you've got something that can't be translated to an audio, it's very important to be able to read. The reason why that capability is so limited now is the limitation of our electrodes. The, uh, the Argus II, uh, by a company called Second Sight was FDA approved in 2013. It has an electrode, however, that's only about 10 by 10, so 100 total spots, uh, 100 total dots can be represented. However, what they're currently working on is how to handle the signals going to a 1,000 by 1,000 array, which is going to provide something that starts looking like real vision. Again, it's not for everybody because the important part is the neurons in the back of the eye have to be intact. Retinitis pigmentosa, macular degeneration, a couple other conditions uh, such as uh, corneal uh, scarring, corneal uh, uh, It's sort of like a corneal cataract where it becomes opaque and you can't see through it. We do have surgeries that can replace them, but not everybody can, can take that surgery. Uh, similar to a cataract, if you ended up with complications from the cataract, but the neural tissue at the back of the eye is intact, then the Argus II is one possibility for a visual prosthetic. So these are prosthetics that don't necessarily, that, that are for our body senses, our body ability. Uh, what about the brain? Well, what about the brain? We have a number of prosthetics for brain function. Uh, first one's called DBS, and that stands for deep brain stimulation. And deep brain stimulation is for Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. One of the, I mean, We've all seen an individual who has a tremor so bad they can't actually pick something up and hold it. Uh, if it's a cup of coffee or glass of water, they spill it. Or might not even be able to, uh, to grasp it in the first place because they can't stay the hand enough to reach. Well, Parkinson's disease has three major uh, symptoms. They don't show up in everybody. You don't always get all three of them. Uh, you usually get one worse than the others. One is called bradykinesia. That is freezing, inability to start moving. The second is tremor. And there's also uh, something called essential tremor, which is having that same uh, muscle tremor where you can't smoothly move a limb. Uh, and you have essential tremor without having Parkinson's disease. And the third is called freezing of gait. When you're walking, if you, if, you, if you stop moving in the middle of a step, you'll fall forward and spinal reflex will actually move your foot out 
so that to catch you so that you don't fall and you can keep and you can keep moving. What happens in some Parkinson's patients is that's exactly what happens to them. They are in the middle of a step and the brain can't send the signal to the muscles in the leg that says keep moving, keep stepping. And so they're in the middle of a step, they freeze, they fall forward, the spinal reflex moves the, the leg and the foot for them, and then everything resets and they can walk. Well, if we put an electrode in the thalamus, and particularly in the subthalamic nucleus, that's in here right about, uh, go about two, three inches in, so it's right at the center of the brain, and we give a fixed stimulation. It's, it's running constantly. It's running constantly, just like a carrier wave. It will break bradykinesia. It can dampen tremor. And if tuned properly, it can even solve the problem with freezing of gait. Now, unfortunately, the frequencies required to do each of those effects are not the same. So one program stimulation isn't gonna fix everything. It can, it might even make some elements worse. You might fix the freezing and make the tremor a little bit worse. You may fix the tremor and make the, the freezing of gain a little bit worse. There are, there is work now that is saying, okay, can we give a mixture of frequencies? So we'll give 100 hertz now for about, uh, for about a tenth of a second, then we'll give 160 hertz for two tenths of a second, and then we'll drop down to 30 hertz for two tenths of a second, and then we'll go back to 100 hertz, and now we'll do four tenths of a second and, and such, and then goes in a, a pseudo-random pattern, and the scientists who work, the neurologists who work with Parkinson's and essential tremor are looking at ways to allow one implant to, to, have, all, to have all of those effects. We've also found mainly through cases in which the targeting to get the electrode in is just a little bit off that deep brain stimulation is actually effective at breaking anxiety, uh, resolving depression, resolving OCD, and even possibly some emotional components as well. Now, <clears throat> this, is, this is the terminal man, okay? This is putting an electrode in and providing a stimulation to stop an unwanted brain activity. You wanna know how common this is? This is Sunday, tomorrow morning is Monday. At 6 a.m. tomorrow morning, 150 operating rooms will be putting a deep brain stimulating electrode in place. That's how common it is around the world, yeah. Worldwide. Worldwide. But, but most deep brain stimulation is being done in the US and Germany for the most part. Yes? I can't help but wonder um, the probe that is going down through the brain, obviously, a hole is drilled to uh, facilitate that. Yes. Uh, does this not have an effect on the surrounding uh, brain tissue? Yes, it does. Biggest shortcoming in prosthetics for the brain is an electrode that will do minimal disruption and survive everything that the brain tissue can do to it. We're sticking it into an electrically active salt bath and hoping that it's gonna last 10, 20 years. Uh, the, right now, for some of the more complicated electrodes, uh, we're, we're doing okay at about five years. DBS electrodes are doing pretty well at 10. Um, 10 years of not having tremor is a significant improvement in quality of life. Uh, it may or may not be possible to recondition or replace an electrode. Um, success on that is mixed. By the way, the complication rate for sticking an electrode in your brain is less complication and chance of infection than breast augmentation uh, surgery. Wow. Most plastic surgeries have a higher complication rate than DBS. Yeah. So the so the active electrodes are generally some variation on polyimide, uh, very inert plastic polymer, 
and the uh, um, some of them are flat ribbons, some of them are tubes, and then the electrodes themselves tend to be platinum, platinum on, on stainless steel. So, yes? I was going to say gold. Uh, gold does not work as well. Gold is, is more reactive than platinum in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Possibly some other rare earth. Gold works. Uh, we used to use silver all the time, but silver is very reactive. Oh, God. Yeah. So here's another brain implant prosthetic. It's called responsive neural stimulation. It also goes by the name NeuroPace because that's the brand name of the device. Uh, and what this is, is a stimulator to stop epileptic seizures. There, you know, there are electrodes. What you can see here, oh, yeah, oh well, it's gonna let me zoom. Oh yeah, great, it'll let me zoom in just fine. So right here, we have an electrode, a long depth electrode that goes into an area of the brain uh, with which I'm extremely familiar, it's called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is the place that I talk about when I talk about memory codes and trying to come up with a prosthetic for memory. Uh, but also, it's very sensitive to disruption. Epileptic seizure is something we don't want. You don't want all the neurons in an area firing off at once, in synchrony. This is not a good thing. Most of the time, the brain is asynchronous. Uh, yes, we can look at EEG and we can see rhythms and everything like that, but the vast majority of the brain is asynchronous. One of the ways you actually get a rhythm is that the cells don't have to fire all at the same time on the same uh, waveform. Uh, if you've got a rhythm that is 10 times per second, you can have cells that only fire once per second. Some of them fire on the first wave, some on the second, some on the third, some on the fourth, some on the fifth. So we can get oscillators and rhythms without neurons firing synchronously, simultaneously. When they do, epileptic seizure. What the, uh, what the electrodes in this case do, both a uh, cortical strip lead that's going to sit under the skull, but on top of the brain tissue, and then the depth electrode actually goes deep into the brain. They detect when that synchrony occurs and they start a counter stimulation. The counter stimulation then causes a whole area to be unable to fire synchronously because what you've done is you stimulated it first. Every time a, a, a neuron, a nerve cell fires, it has a five to 10 millisecond quiet period that follows it. It's very difficult to get, get it to fire again. Well, if you then stimulate in an area where a seizure is starting to go, you actually can block the seizure. It's kind of like uh, forest, you fight a forest fire by circling it with a clear cut area and then start a fire to what they call a backfire to burn toward the center where the, the, the fire is so that when the two meet, everything's charred and there's nothing there to burn and then you can you can stop a fire. Well, that's what a responsive neural stimulator works like, which is to uh, is to stop the spread of the seizure activity. Now, there is another alternative. The vagus nerve that runs down here goes to the heart and a number of other organs can also, you can stimulate that and it sends a signal back to the brain that also appears to be very successful in uh, in stopping the seizures, maybe about 30% of seizures. And stopping 30% of seizures is a significant improvement in quality of life for persons with uncontrolled epilepsy. Uh, does this typically work for all forms of epilepsy? No, it does not. Okay. Um, these are generally used in cases where the seizure starts in multiple places, either multiple <coughs> places at once, or it starts here, one seizure starts there, another seizure starts over here, another seizure, and so on and so forth. So multiple focus, complex seizures are the ones they will generally use, either a vagal stimulator or an RNS stimulator. If there is a very, very precise location where the seizure starts every single time, the surgeons are going to either cut it out or use a laser and ablate it. Um, and their general limitation is if I can localize a seizure to about one cubic centimeter, you can actually survive and adapt very well with one less cubic centimeter of brain, unless it's your speech zone. 
How do they determine where the seizure starts? Is it MRI or Well, actually, it's very, very interesting, and it actually dovetails with my own research because what they do is the first thing they'll they'll use an MRI and they'll look for structural abnormality. Then they'll take a patient in and they'll paste up 30 some electrodes on their scalp and they'll wait to see if they have a seizure. And sometimes you can use uh, photostimulation. You can flash a light at them uh, and you deprive them of sleep and that makes it much more likely that a seizure will occur. Then you look and you see where it occurs with the uh, using the EEG recordings, that may not be enough. It may then be necessary to go to a phase two study. With the phase two study, they'll put in a series of these depth electrodes in and around areas that they think may be involved, and also enough other areas that essentially they're triangulating. Um, with the memory prosthetic work that I do, we are working with testing in human patients, and we use phase two patients because there are periods of time during this study in which they're not really going to have seizures because one of the key things they do is, is a person with, that needs a phase two has epilepsy that doesn't respond well to drugs, and so they're very heavily medicated. So the first thing that has to be done after the surgery is you have to taper them off the drug. And when that's happening, we walk in and we do, we work with our study as well because a key area of the brain that has electrodes is hippocampus. And we can go in and look for memory codes during that. And what about MR spectroscopy? MR spectroscopy, it doesn't, MR spectroscopy is mostly for structure. So we use MR spectroscopy for structure. We do use magnetoencephalography and we use a little bit of functional magnetic resonance, but you have to have a seizure. And that means you can't figure out what's going on until you actually have a seizure. You don't really want a person having a seizure in the MRI machine. They're in an awkward position. They're in a confined area. They're laying on their back. There are many, many medical reasons why you would rather not have a person have a seizure in the MR. So I've already talked a little bit about the idea we have of the neural prosthetic memory. And with that, this is ongoing development. This is DARPA funded. Uh, we have published our initial papers in this and had some publicity. And I still end up getting uh, about an inquiry a, a week. And we do have uh, uh, newspapers and other outlets that are very interested. And as a matter of fact, two weeks ago, I was interviewed by BYU Radio. And so I was in there, uh, uh, I was on that, oh gosh, I can't even remember the name of the program. It's mid-afternoon program. Uh, and they, so they interviewed me and I, you know, I was on live, it's really weird. I, I, most of the time I'm giving an interview or something like that, it's recorded, I'm talking on the phone and with BYU on live. And that was really, really, really neat actually. Uh, but for neuroprosthetic memory, what we're looking for is we have two approaches. One is can we go into the hippocampus, the area where the code for memory is formed and decipher that code. The other is can we just look at total brain activity during normal functions? Uh, and it can be, um, okay, I'm gonna play you a, I'm gonna show you or speak to you a list of words and then I'm gonna make you do something else and I want you to free recall uh, as many of those words as possible. Uh, so on the left you have the concepts of going into the hippocampus and looking for the codes, which is the approach used by Wake Forest and USC in their project. The, on the right we have the idea of looking at the surface of the brain, looking at all of these patterns and say, is there an overall state of the brain that is associated with correct memory function? and a state that is associated with erroneous, incorrect memory function, and what would it take to flip the brain into that correct function state? And so what they found is they, they recorded 300, 300 and some patients, uh, 1,200 different areas of the brain in the course of this work, and they showed that they could, in fact, there was a particular place in the temporal lobe right around here that they could stimulate and flip the brain into a more uh, efficient memory functioning area. They had about 15% improvement in memory. Uh, there is, that is actually very useful and could be 
very useful, especially as a learning aid and a number of other uh, conditions for promoting memory after memory loss. However, if the hippocampus is damaged and you can't make the codes, there's not going to be a whole lot of point in putting the brain into a better memory state when there's no codes. So what our group has been doing is looking at the codes and is there a way to come up with something like a true prosthetic that would be a bypass to the damaged part of the brain. <coughs> So those are the brain prosthetics and, and where we're going with that. So there's another direction that we could go, and that is the actual brain-controlled prosthetics. So let's take a look at a brain-controlled prosthetic. Okay, where's my play? When you picture today's bionic man, we have a new face to bring to mind. He's a Florida man who had his arm amputated during cancer treatment a decade ago. After years of using traditional prosthetics, he's become a bionic pioneer. Ursula Perry shows us how a targeted muscle re innervation program is starting to rewire damaged body parts. And watch this. Johnny can see he hears about TMR. He called Dr. Albert Chi right away. I said, you know, this is going to happen. A lot of people with orgs. A lot of people. And that's what I want to do. I'm paying my life forward, so I want to help as many people as I can. It's really like a surgical rewiring of the body. This allows patients to move Look prosthetics with intuitive Look at that thought. Movement. We take nerve endings that used to travel to the missing limb, reroute them to residual muscles that are still there. So now we can actually take that information that used to be traveling to nothing and have a way to actually record from it, amplify it, and translate that to useful movement. After attaching the arm to the titanium implant on his bone, Johnny a does a training implant. set for specific movements. His brain tells his muscles what to do. Signals go through Bluetooth MYO bands into a cell phone and back to the arm. You don't have to make anything different. It works just like your natural arm. You do like this, you grab things, you know, you train, you know, take your wrist, bend your elbow. It's not easy. Johnny went through months of training before he could do things like this, but the end result? Priceless. Somebody that, you know, is totally dependent on somebody. Now they got a little bit of pride, a little bit of their life back because they can reach down and get, get their own drink. They can feed themselves. Johnny sees endless possibilities. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Amazing. Johnny is the first person in the country with an osseo integration implant with TMR. It gives him greater range of motion and removes the need for a shoulder harness to keep the prosthetic on. The next step is a surgery that will actually enable him to feel things with his arm. So, this arm is a little bit heavier than a flesh and blood arm. One of the actual fascinating things is you saw the pickups on the upper arm. No Bluetooth, as was mentioned. There, there's a couple of pickups that he can use. Uh, it uses a lot of battery. He can, he can, uh, with minimal function, he can operate for about three hours a day. Uh, with a lot, with when doing a demo, he can operate the Bluetooth for about 30 minutes, and then he has to switch to a wired version. Um, the batteries in the in the limb itself are good for about an hour of heavy use, about three hours of light use. The funny part to watch Johnny, and I have met Johnny, and I've shook his real and his artificial hand, and he has a good, nice grip with the artificial, with the artificial hand, and the mount that connects to that titanium stem that's just an extension of his upper arm bone has a magnetic coupling down right at the elbow. He can take the arm off and hold it out and shake your hand, and you can feel it gripping because of the the, uh, the wireless Bluetooth. He can't quite do thing where he sets it down and it locks itself <laughs> across the table. Uh, and the, the joints aren't the servos are not quite that strong. It's just a little bit too heavy. It is a little bit. It is a bit heavier than a human arm. The the Luke arm that I showed earlier is not osseo integrated. So it doesn't have the stem connected to the bone, but it, uh, but it's lighter and is a little more functional. So let's take that to a different. This is this is for an amputee. Now let's take this in a different direction, and let's talk about a person who may be paralyzed. So here's Jan Sherman. You know, 
people are going to look at those pedestals in your skull and they're going to think that has to hurt. Is, is it is it painful? Has it been difficult in any way? For a few hours after I woke up, I had the worst case of buyer's remorse. So I was <laughs> thinking, oh my God, I had brain surgery. Why didn't anyone stop me? Why didn't they say, Jan, you're crazy? But as soon as the headache went away, that kind of talk went away too. Five months after the surgery, we came back to see whether she would be able to control the robotic arm with nothing but her thoughts. They plugged her brain into the computer, and this is what we saw. I can move it up and straight down and left and right and diagonally. I can close it and open it, and I can go forward and back. That is just the most astounding thing I've ever seen. Can we shake hands? Sure. No, really. Yeah. Like, come right over here? Yes, you come over okay. there. Grasp your hand there. There we go. Oh my goodness. Wow. And I can do a fist bump if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. What are you doing, Jan? What's going on in your mind as you're moving this arm around? What are you thinking? Okay, the best way to play is raise your arm. Uh-huh. Good. Now, right. what did you think about when you did that? Well, not very much. I do it all the exactly. time. Exactly. It's automatic. Is that hard work? Are you having to concentrate? It, no, it was hard work getting there. I struggled greatly to go up and down, getting out, up and down, and so we don't even think about it side to side. By the way, that was more training her brain just than like training just like your arms used to. Yes. Jan Sherman showed us that by thinking about a particular movement, she can isolate the brain cells or neurons firing from a certain region in her brain. Jan, now fire that neuron. How do you do that? I'm imagining opening and closing my fist. She's gotten so good at it, she can make a single brain cell fire. You just have complete control of that. You can fire sure, it anytime yeah, you want to. I'm holding it still now. Who here is local to this area? It's local. The company that <laughs> makes that recording hardware is insolvency. <laughs> That's the system I use, and I've come out here several times for training. Uh, the, if any of you saw the um, the implants lecture on Friday morning, uh, yeah, Friday morning uh, by Nick Halper. Uh, Nick works for that company, and they have done fantastic stuff. Now, what Jan has is she has an electrode that sits on the motor part of the brain. This is a truly brain-controlled robotic arm. And okay, great, thanks. Uh, so. That's a, uh, a pickup, and by the way, the uh, it's a thousand, uh, it's it's a, it's a hundred to a thousand uh, electrode pickup in an area smaller than your little fingernail, very very small, uh, and she had to have these fairly large pedestals to connect them because of all of the signals that go through it, but uh, it's still it's it's an absolutely amazing technique now. There's a couple of sad parts to the story. Uh, the program ended. Johnny does not have his arm anymore. He has a uh, he has a strap-on prosthetic with a uh, rudimentary hook. Uh, not not a hook. He's got a, he's a grasping hand, a hand that will that will manipulate. Uh, Jan has had her electrodes removed. There is another person now working that particular project who has had the brain implants. Um, but for infection reasons and for FDA and medical reasons, there, when you get past a certain point of it, everything has to be maintained and all the maintenance requires money and it requires a funding source. I do know that I watched a couple of people say, okay, we gotta figure out how to get Johnny back his arm. Uh, but uh, in the case of Jan, we're, our technology is not quite at the point where with that could have been left in place. Yeah. Yeah, as you were, as, as we're watching that, I was saying like, that looks like expensive technology. What do you think is the time frame where something like those become 
widespread where the average user Luke, has that capability of having Luke that. Luke is under 100,000 and coming down. <laughs> and, so, and, it, and it has been approved for uh, Medicare and FDA reimbursement. Okay. So the, the robotic arm that we just saw, we're probably, that's, it's really gonna require a lot of electro development. Where most of us in the field say that we have to do the most work right now is better, longer lasting, less expensive electrodes. Right now, an electrode that would work for what I'm wanting to do with memory is probably cost about two million for the electrode development. So we have a lot to go yet. However, you know, uh, we do have brain controlled toys. And so the neck may be ears just use a simple pickup for uh for eeg and you can it's actually very easy to flip your brain activity in and out of the alpha state and when you do those little furry ears will wiggle <laughs> and then there's the brainwave starter kit the brainwave starter kit is actually uh being used for cursor control in games and uh, something like that, very much consumer-oriented product, is being used for people who are locked in. They're quadriplegic, or uh, even in cases of losing power of speech. And a lot of what we're looking at right now for people who are quadriplegic involves facial movements, eye twitches, eye blinks, and everything else like that. We actually have ways of recording signals from the scalp and you can put an image on a screen and you can flash it at a particular frequency and visual areas of the brain will start to show that frequency. So if the person is looking, you can start putting a whole <coughs> bunch of letters on a screen, every single one of them flashing at a different frequency, tell the person, okay, concentrate on one letter, and when you pick up that frequency flash associated with that one letter, you then outline it and say, is this it? and the person blinks and you move on to the next one. And it's actually uh, become very, very uh, standard now to equip people with these, uh, something like the uh, NeuroSky Brainwave uh, Starter Kit and show that they can uh, operate computers and speech and text-to-speech processors and the like. So we do have interfaces that are inexpensive that can operate this way. Uh, so, I totally can't tell you that one of the big questions now is if you can control robotic limb, could you control a drone? I, I totally can't talk about that. Uh, so, uh, so one of the questions now, I mean, we're looking at, at computer interfaces, we're looking at artificial limbs. Uh, so there are, you know, can we use these interfaces to control? And the answer is, yeah, we probably can. Uh, if you can control the limb, uh, how would you, uh, you know, how would you move, how would you figure out how to, uh, okay, instead of figure your throttle is your thumb and your uh, brakes are your index finger and remap it. So back to science fiction. The fourth book that Martin Caden wrote in his Cyborg series called unimaginatively titled Cyborg 4. Um, <laughs> Steve Austin is in an experimental uh, space plane in which they gave him a hookup so that his arm and his two legs uh, were, uh, they had an attachment point. They went through and they gave him a modification to his bionics and he basically jacked himself into the controls of this experimental space plane. And frankly, if you had a person who was quadriplegic who could control their power chair, and their text-to-speech and their uh, and their BCI speller with something like that, it would be absolutely fantastic. So, whatever happened to the six million dollar man? The six million dollar man is here. It only took us forty-five years. Uh, I find myself absolutely privileged to work with every one of these projects. I know the people who are doing this. And that is actually kind of you know, awe-inspiring to know that there are surgeons going in, putting electrodes in, uh, resolving problems with 
epilepsy and with Parkinson's disease. Um, the laboratory, uh, the laboratory at Pitt at Carnegie Mellon uh, is run by a friend of mine, the one that worked the uh, the, uh, um, the artificial arm, the, the robotic arm. Uh, the people who do the artificial arm, I was in a meeting with them in May. And yep, thank you, for winding it up. Uh, and so, no, it, it's, I, I feel privileged to know these people who are doing this. I think it's fantastic work. And I am an absolute, uh, you know, preaching the gospel of bionics. This is where we're going. This is what science is doing. And we are pretty much out of time. I will stick around in the hallway if you want to talk afterward. Because uh, I think we probably should go ahead and clear out the room because it's taking a couple minutes to get broken down. Yes, quick. Uh, uh, you have uh, the brain chip uh, theories. Oh, the brain chip theories. I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that one. Uh, uh, I love that one. Uh, uh, one of the, the books, uh, the chip research, uh, details uh, how uh, uh, they actually develop. Right. right, and 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 so the so the that book was very very well written, and I used it as part. There is a um, uh, there is an article. I write articles for Bain Books, and there is an article on the Bain Books site. You can go searching for it, uh, or you can actually uh, I'll have cards that have my website, and you can go there and you can go find. And it's called the uh, from. Uh, from brain chips, from bionics to brain chips, I believe it's called. At any rate, it's an update on interfaces, and it talks very specifically about how this research ties in with uh, what the uh, brain chips were written to do. But thank you very much. I appreciate you coming out this early on a Sunday morning.